happy little games. In the mid to late 1980s, arcades sure had a lot of unique cabinets. Usually, these came from the wonderful Wizards at Sega and offered us a very immersive experience in addition to some good old-fashioned video game fun. Whether it was going back in time to play the game Time Traveler with its holographic goodness, hang on in which you climbed aboard a motorbike bobbing and weaving like a prize fighter, narrowly avoiding the other bikes on the course, and of course, the big one is the motorized version of OutRun. Today, we are going to talk about a game in particular that I have always loved. I was 14 years old, visiting the arcade at Fox Valley Mall in Aurora, Illinois, when I saw the lovely behemoth known as Power Drift. This was the first motion cabinet I had ever seen, and I was completely blown away. Power Drift combined kart racing with the oh-so-sexy sprite scaling that Sega is known for, all the while bouncing you around side to side like a pinball hopped up on meth. What hidden vehicles can you unlock in this arcade game? So hop into your carts and get ready to sit and spin because this is the history of Power Drift. The year is 1987 and Sega's superstar designer Yu Suzuki is trying to come up with ideas for his next arcade classic. Any retro gaming fan worth his weight in salt will tell you that Mr. Suzuki is a legend and has given us a number of memorable arcade hits. The man has been responsible for Hang On. Space Harrier, Afterburner, and Virtua Fighter, just to name a few. He decided to create a game that was built from the ground up to allow lag-free networked competition since nothing like this had existed at that point. Something else that motivated Mr. Suzuki was the arrival of the Y-Board in 1988, which was powered by three 68,000 CPUs. The previous generation used the X-Board, which added sprite and background rotational effects to the existing scaling capabilities found in the chipset. The Y-Board was a serious piece of hardware that allowed individual sprites and the background to be rotated even while being scaled. The first game to utilize the Y-Board was none other than Galaxy Force. After seeing this spectacular game in action, he had wondered if he could use this banging piece of hardware to create a racing game, but with the obvious Suzuki touches. The game would combine two loves of Mr. Suzuki. The first was going off-road through the forest roads around Mount Fuji on his motorcycle, and his second love was roller coasters. He didn't want to stick with a standard race car format, which is why he decided to use go-karts. The game comprises all of its track layouts with flat bitmaps making it look like you're driving over a series of Lincoln Logs. It sounds strange, but it totally works. One big appeal of the arcade game OutRun were the multiple tracks and the freedom to choose the route that you take. Mr. Suzuki wanted to implement this with his brand new game, but also include some secrets along the way. Similar to the full-size OutRun cabinets, this game would also benefit from the motion cabinet, and let me tell you folks, if you have never experienced it for yourself, track one down and do so. 
This game tends to bounce you around quite a bit more than the motorized outrun cabinet, so be prepared. Sega even included a seatbelt in this game, but that could have been just a gimmick. If you are playing the Japanese version, a number of billboards are seen such as Coca-Cola, Budweiser, and Popeye beer, but they are changed just enough so that when you're driving by extremely fast, you don't even notice. In the American version, a lot of these billboards are removed completely, so you'll never get a chance to see advertisements for Coma Cola or Bub Weiser Beer. Power Drift barreled its way into arcades in 1988. The object of the game is to, obviously, place first in each race, although you do need to place in at least third to advance to the next one. There are 12 drivers to choose from, including Emily, Eric, Harry, Jason, Geronimo, Keith, Lucy, who looks like Lucy Ricardo from I Love Lucy, and Tom. It doesn't matter which racer you choose because their stats are all identical. Each race consists of four laps and they are over quicker than a heartbeat. There are five courses available, A, B, C, D, and E, with each course having five races for a grand total of 25 tracks. Not much by today's standards, but for an arcade game in 1988, it was filled to the brim. It's a straightforward racing game with a steering wheel, accelerator, and gear shift. The first thing you notice when selecting a course is the dramatic flyby camera which lets you see exactly what you're up against. Now you can finally see the true scope of what you've gotten yourself into. Along with the crazy tracks, there are five unique pieces of music for each course similar to OutRun. There is a bit of jaw jacking between the drivers, but they tend to get drowned out by all the sound effects, including the loud squealing of the tires. Once the flag is dropped, you are off to the races. As soon as you turn that very first corner, the viewpoint tilts sharply around the back of your car. It's unusual the first time it happens, and if you're not expecting it, you might get just a little bit queasy since it happens so often. Once you get on a tall bridge, there are no handy dandy guardrails as you would find on a real roller coaster. It's easy to fall off which sees your car flip over and over while the camera zooms in on the carnage. Thankfully, Mr. Suzuki included a rolling start to get you right back into the action as quick as possible. The tracks have a lot of dives, curves, and jumps, which when playing on a full-size cabinet is a lot of fun to experience. A hidden trick that is not advertised anywhere on the cabinet is the rear view mode which you can access by pressing the start button. Since the courses are so short and you are racing against 11 other drivers, the road can get a bit cluttered at times. There does seem to be a bit of an issue with the collision detection as sometimes when going around corners you will pass straight through a roadside object. If you manage to place first in all five stages, you will unlock an extra stage. If you are racing on courses A, C, or D, your car will magically morph into the F-14 Tomcat from Afterburner, letting you fly around the course with the greatest of ease. If you get first place on courses B or D, your car transforms into the bike from Super Hang On. This 
brings the grand total of stages to 30. The game was not that well received in America, but it did have quite the following in Europe. That is, if you could pony up the one pound asking price to play. Here in the States, the game was 50 cents, which wasn't that terrible back in 1988. There were a few ideas left out, including your choice of different car models, engines, front drives, rear drives, and tire grip, among others. The developers felt that these options would bog the game down and that players wanted to get into the action as quickly as possible. If you are going to download a version and try it on MAME, I would suggest the Japanese ROM set so you get to view all those lovely unofficial billboards. The story of Power Drift does not end here though as Mr. Suzuki was able to get that network capability up and running. However, he had second thoughts about including it. The development team felt that the courses were a bit too cramped with the vast amount of racers and the high speed of the gameplay. With 1987's release of Namco's final lap and its 8 player Formula 1 racing capability, Sega knew they had to compete. The follow-up title was dubbed Power Drift Sushin Sizen or Network vs. Battle, which included a number of gameplay changes. For starters, the gameplay speed is much slower and the crazy, wacky courses were reworked into normal courses. Rather than place in the top three to advance as in the original game, the first race is now a practice run which included stricter requirements for placement. As you can see, the layout is slightly different from the original arcade game. The emulation is not working 100% yet, but you can still download it and try it out for yourself on MAME. As far as spiritual successors go, Sega released Sonic Drift in 1994 for the Game Gear. The gameplay was directly inspired from Power Drift. The stages are all flat which makes it look more like a Mario Kart ripoff than anything else. You have your choice of four characters, Sonic, Tails, Amy, and Dr. Robotnik. Each character has their own attributes and the gameplay is nice and tight. The tracks are based on levels from the original Sonic the Hedgehog game. Littered throughout the various tracks are gold rings that can be collected to use as a unique special attack for each character. The game was so popular that a sequel, Sonic Drift 2, was released in 1995. The series was only released in Japan due to Sega CEO Tom Kalinske feeling that the quality wasn't that great and replaced it with Sonic Spinball here in the States. If you're looking to get that arcade experience at home but needed a steering wheel and pedals to go along with it, then Arcade 1UP have you covered. The game was included in the OutRun mini cabinet along with Turbo OutRun and OutRunners. It is not a full size motion cabinet but it's an awesome alternative so if you can do without a little motion in the ocean then you should definitely check this out. The game was converted to a number of home computers back in 1989, which I will cover in just a moment. When it came to retro console releases at the time, Sega did not release any versions of Power Drift for its home systems. A Mega CD and 32X version were rumored to have been in development, but neither version saw the light of day. 
As far as console releases go, there was only one released for the PC Engine back in 1990, which was done by ASMIC. The developers tried to retain the large sprites found in the arcade game, but obviously they were scaled back. Since the PC Engine does not have any scaling or rotation functions built in, it has to use different size sprites that it interchanges on the fly. There were only 6 racers on the track instead of 12, and even with the limited amount of on-screen action there was still a bit of flickering. Instead of the 30 tracks found in the arcade game, including the 5 hidden ones, this version includes only 9 and they are all played through sequentially, meaning you can't choose which one you race on. There is one hidden track which is the afterburner course. The developers seem to have picked the best of the arcade's 30 tracks and included the ones here that didn't affect performance too greatly. The frame rate is still not that great, but the controls are decent, although not quite as tight as I would have liked. We do get some nice music and sound effects with voices. You can also pick the color of your go-kart. Sega Ages Power Drift was released in 1998 and at the time, it was the best version released for the home market. This was part of the Sega Ages arcade conversions and it is one of my favorites in the series right alongside OutRun. A Grand Prix mode has been included which greatly increases the gameplay length. At first glance, it looks very close to being arcade perfect, although this version only runs at 30 frames per second, which, compared to some of the home computer ports we are going to look at, is like night and day. The game includes the actual arcade music or an option for an arranged style, which sounds pretty good. The controls are fantastic, and it even includes support for the 3D control pad. This was another spectacular home version, especially if you got to play it on your Japanese Saturn back in 1998. The best retro home port to come along was featured on Yu Suzuki's Gameworks Volume 1, which was released in 2001. This is a compilation of games including Afterburner 2, Super Hang On, Outrun, and Space Harrier. This is a straight up port of the arcade game so it doesn't have the arranged music or tournament modes. With that being said, the visuals have been upscaled and filtered and now it runs at a silky smooth 60 frames per second. Some of the more blatant billboards such as Coma Cola and Bub Weiser Beer have been slightly changed but other than that, this is Arcade Perfect. Perhaps even a little better than Arcade Perfect. The gameplay is stellar and this was definitely the best home version to be released at that time. The absolute best version of Power Drift would have to be in 3D Power Drift which was released for the Nintendo 3DS as a part of the 3D Classics line. This features stereoscopic 3D visuals which have to be seen to be believed. It looks utterly fantastic. The game also includes adjustable difficulties as well as a widescreen mode. If you are playing the Japanese standalone version, this includes Sega characters in place of the originals from the arcade game. 
The characters are Harrier from Space Harrier, Beast from Altered Beast, Flagman from Outrun, Joe Musashi from Shinobi, and more. The music on each track has also been replaced with themes from various Sega arcade games. The visuals are silky smooth, but once again, Sega had to change some of its billboards to avoid any legal action. The sound is excellent and the controls are perfect. If you are a fan of Power Drift and love the 3D aspect of the 3DS, then you owe it to yourself to try this game out on a real system. In 1989, Activision brought us a whole slew of conversions for the various home computers and to be honest, they probably shouldn't have. They're not all bad, but then again, they're not all good either. The first conversion we are looking at is for MS-DOS. For a 1990 MS-DOS release, this turned out much better than I expected. This almost feels like a souped up version of the Commodore 64 release but with more bells and whistles including some fantastic audio along with sampled voice clips. The graphics are very colorful displaying its goodies in VGA. The scrolling is nice and smooth and there are plenty of dips and dives. The landscape is a bit barren though as opposed to the arcade original. For some strange reason, the road looks like static from an old black and white TV, but it is fast and it plays great. All the courses are included as well as the hidden stages. This is a fantastic little version of Power Drift. The Spectrum version looks to be a bit of a jumbled, bumbled mess, but surprisingly it moves along at a fairly decent pace. For Specky owners with 128k of memory, you are treated to a single load and your choice between music and sound effects. The music actually sounds pretty good. For users with only 48k of RAM, you were treated to a multi-load after each individual track and nothing but SBDs as far as the sound goes. Graphically, it looks pretty good, although there is an overabundance of yellow and blues. When you are ascending across one of the elevated tracks, it's a bit hard to make out where your razor is due to some nasty color clash. There is also not a lot of variety in terms of the roadside objects. Aside from the rotating camera view at the beginning of each race, everything else is pretty much here including the hidden stages and vehicles. It also plays really well. Let's go ahead and check out the Amstrad version. A little bit of color goes a long, long way and this version looks great. We get a nice little intro tune on the menu screen but sound effects only during gameplay. The scrolling is fairly smooth with large detailed roadside objects although similar to the Spectrum a lot of the billboards did not make it over. Since this game used about 85% of the Spectrum code, the same things apply including the secret levels and the top-notch gameplay.
Sticking with the 8-bit line, let's take a look at the MSX version. This appears to be a straight up port of the Spectrum, only running a little bit slower and looking a little bit uglier. There is absolutely no sound, but it does control fairly well. Let's switch over and take a look at the Amiga version. This was produced by ZZKJ and Software Studios, who had previously ported the wonderful Super Hang-On to the Amiga. Now I know I'm going to get a lot of flack of this because people tend to rag on this game, but I honestly enjoyed it back in the day. Perhaps I still have my rose-colored Elton John glasses on, but I still don't think it looks terrible. The graphics are large and colorful, but the problem is with the frame rate. We are looking at around 7 frames per second, which is terrible for a racing game. The developers at least tried to bring over the entire arcade presentation, including the swooping camera angles before each race. Once you get used to the limited frame rate, it doesn't play that bad. We have some pretty good music and crystal clear sampled voices and sound effects which really helps the overall experience. Apparently Sega had failed to give any of the arcade games assets to the developers which meant they had to take hundreds of photos of the arcade machine in action. All in all, it's not as bad as people say so check it out if you think I'm crazy. The Atari ST version did not fare quite as well. While graphically it looks similar in still shots, the frame rate is even lower dropping down to 3-4 to four frames per second at certain points. The sample sound effects and voices are decent although not quite as clear as found on the Amiga. The music is missing entirely. It still plays pretty good if you can get used to the horrible frame rate. The Commodore 64 version is extremely well done. This was written by Chris Butler who had previously converted Thunderblade to the 64. Work started in February of 1989 and Mr. Butler was given a deadline of September. In the contract, there was a 250 pound penalty clause for every week missed past the deadline. With that being said, he did a fantastic job on this game. The game is extremely fast and the scrolling is fairly smooth. The roadside objects are huge and varied for the most part and even includes some of the billboards found in the arcade game. All of the courses are here, although the hidden stages and vehicles are missing. The music is really good and the gameplay is fantastic. That takes care of the history of Power Grip. This game was really influential when it came to motorized cabinets and wanting to feel immersed in all the games I play. Ever since then, I've wanted to recreate that feeling I felt when playing Power Drift for the first time. It's a fun little racing game that sometimes doesn't get the credit it deserves, especially here in the States. 
If you love racing games, especially ones that take place on top of a roller coaster, then you owe it to yourself to give this game a shot. You'll be glad you did. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. If you would like to contribute but not sign up for my Patreon, you can always click the donate button up above. Thanks everyone for watching.